When I was asleep last night, and this is something that happens regularly, is I had a dream that while I was preaching this morning that I floated off the stage and ended up in the ceiling. Now, that would be great if that literally happened. I'm sure Vanessa would jump up and try and bring some order to the service and grab my feet. I can imagine her floating up with me. But it may be literal, but but definitely it is a spiritual picture that we're invited to enter into the deep things of the Spirit. And they're not nebulous, they're not, they're not deep just for the sake of being deep. They're, they're deep because God wants to open up reality to us. And the older I get, the, the more aware I am that, that many people live all their life in a pseudo-reality. And, and it's not real. They're chasing after shadows and we can miss the whole purpose of life, God's purpose for us, because we're so caught up with ourselves, our own needs, our own desires, and we're missing what God wants to communicate to us. So I'm praying that somehow in this message that God will connect with you and take you on your own journey. So we've talked about uh, the wells of revival, and I really enjoyed that. I trust that last week was a real blessing to you. And I felt Holy Spirit say to move from that message into a, a number of messages on the person and the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit. You should be excited because I'll just let you in on something. Jesus really doesn't live in your heart. He's in heaven. He's not inside you. He's in heaven. I know people tell you Jesus lives in me, but really he doesn't. He's in heaven, isn't he? With a physical body, he's beside the Father. But the wonderful thing is the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of Christ, he lives inside you. He's the third member of the Trinity, not, the, not because he's the least, but he is the, the, the member of the Trinity who has the assignment on earth to work with you and prepare you for your relationship with Jesus and the Father. In, in many ways, Holy Spirit is the most important member of the Trinity in your life and probably the least understood. And so we're going to look at that over the next number of weeks. But I want to set the scene by taking you to one of my and I've got lots of favourite scriptures, but as a young boy, this was probably one of my favourite scriptures. So I want you to open your Bibles, blow the dust off this chapter, because you may not have gone there for a while. Go with me to Zechariah. Zechariah is prophesying because the Jews have been bound in captivity They've been in Babylon for 70 years. And so Zechariah's got a prophecy for Zerubbabel that's going to change everything. Now, isn't it interesting they've been in Babylon for 70 years? What's significant about 70? Well, 70 is the number of the kingdom of God. 70 times the phrase the kingdom of God is mentioned in the scripture. It's the number of generations. It's really the work of the Holy Spirit because it's seven times 10. And so whenever you're doing numbers in the Bible, seven and 10, you add them together, you get 17. But when you multiply it, you get a multiplication of the effect of those numbers. And so we know that 70 is the kingdom of God, but it's also seven and 10. Seven is the Holy Spirit's creative work to bring God's plan to completion or rest. And 10 is the number of divine order. And so we see here that Holy Spirit is at work with these people in Babylon to get them ready for a significant transition in their life. So they would, in, they would encounter the fullness of the kingdom in their life. So for us, for many of us, we've gone through seasons where it feels like we've been in captivity, where the promises and the purposes of God are inside us but we felt like there's been restriction. And so 
Zechariah is prophesying into a significant generation because they're about to see a huge shift, a transition. They're about to experience the kingdom like never before. So imagine that you grew up in this environment. In fact, Zerubbabel literally means one sown in Babylon. So in, in other words, he was born in captivity. So Zechariah is prophesying to people that have been born in captivity. That's all they know. I've said to you before, one of the reasons I talk to some of the older people in the faith, because they've known something different. And so many people grow up in church and they think, well, this is, this is all there is. And Zechariah is prophesying into the life of a man who's been born and shaped by captivity. And Zechariah is saying, it's all about to change. Turn to the, someone next to you and say, it's all about to change. Now you might say, oh, yeah, whatever. I hope he didn't. But, but that's, think about Zechariah, so, sorry, Zerubbabel, was born in captivity. And Zechariah has been sent by God to say to him, it's all about to change. The kingdom of God is at hand. It's so difficult for people when we've only known one way for God to shift. You say, well, I've heard a thousand sermons. I've been in church all my life. I've heard revivals coming. I've heard the best days are upon us. But I want to say to you today, that's what Zerubbabel faced. And Zechariah came preparing God's people for a significant shift. Zechariah 4.1 then says, and the angel who had been speaking with me returned. So this is Zechariah speaking of his encounter. And this encounter he is then to relate to Zerubbabel. So Zechariah says, Then the angel who had been speaking with me returned and woke me up like a person who was awakened from their sleep. So the first thing that God desires to do today is to wake you up. And that just proves my point. <laughs> he came to me and woke me up. So here's, here's, here's the first truth of many, is that most of us are asleep. And he woke me up like a person who's awakened from their sleep. This is a man who is a prophet of the Lord, and the angel is coming and waking him up from his sleep. So it doesn't matter how deep and connected you are to God, there are, there are realms that God wants to awaken you today too. When you're asleep, you're not aware of what's going on. But most of us, when we're asleep, we're not, we're not aware if someone comes into our room, if someone's doing something, we have no conscious understanding. So God wants to awaken us from our spiritual sleep. There are areas in our life that we're not awakened to. So this shaking that God is doing in the church right now, in our community, in our nation, is to lead to an awakening. So God shakes us. So some of you have been going through some difficult times, some of you may not. But whatever it is that you're facing, I, I, I would I'd be fairly sure that the majority of Christians in our nation are going through a shaking right now. And that shaking is to awaken God's people to what he's about to do. This encounter leads to an awakening. So I'm praying right through this message that God's beginning to awaken you to what he wants to do in your life. Awaken you to ideas, promises. Awaken you to his love for you. Awaken you to his burden for the city. Awaken you to whatever it is that he wants to do in your life. Awaken your people, O Lord, by your spirit. Lord, even right now by your spirit, awaken 
every single person here to the power and presence of the Holy Ghost. I pray that as you leave this place, something has shifted inside you and there's an awakening to a greater level of encounter with the Holy Ghost. Take that. Take it. And he said to him in verse 2, what do you see? And I said, I see. And behold, a lampstand of all gold with its bowl on top of it. And it has seven lamps on it with seven spouts belonging to each of the lamps which are on top of it. Isn't it interesting that when God comes to us, he comes with the most weird and strange pictures. Have a look at this picture. Why would God come to us with such a crazy picture? I don't know. Pictures open up a realm of encounter. And uh, I want to encourage you that many of you are hearing from God in some strange ways and you think they're not God. I don't know that God communicates to many people unless it's strange. Strange to us, but not strange to Him. Welcome to the life of God. This is the way He operates and thinks. He is a God that is very creative and descriptive. And so Zechariah is having this encounter with the angel and he sees this picture. And this picture is going to be a key for Zerubbabel when he leaves captivity and begins to build according to the plan that God has for his life. That on each of the, the arms of the branches of the candlestick or the, the lampstand, pictures of fruit or almonds on the tree. So it's an almond tree. And what's interesting about that, that the word almond means to awaken. And in fact, the almond tree was the first tree in Israel to come out of winter and to blossom and then to give fruit. And so there's a picture again that the Lord is saying to rubble, well, you've been in a season of barrenness, a season where it's been winter, but I'm about to do something in you. And here's the thing, God's people are the ones that awaken first in the community. Something begins to happen in us. There's a, a budding, a fruitfulness, there's a stirring in our hearts. And maybe, just maybe, that God comes to churches or even families or even individuals and says, I want to come through you first. I'm going to awaken you and you're going to awaken your whole row. I'm going to awaken you and you're going to awaken your whole family. I'm going to come to this church and this church is going to awaken the whole city. I'm going to come to this city and this city is going to awaken the whole nation. I'm going to come to our nation and this nation will awaken the whole world. That's what happens. It's the almond tree. So Zechariah is seeing this and he's taking in all this information, these images. And God's beginning to stir him and he's beginning to awaken that something is about to shift in my life, in Zerubbabel, in our nation. God is about to do something to bring us out of captivity and give us our inheritance. Maybe. Just maybe God is coming today to you to awaken you and say, it's time to come out of your slumbering, your winter season. And there's a purpose in the winter season. We'll see in a minute. But it's time to come out of that because a new day is dawning in your life. And I want you to come alive because I want your family to come alive. I want the church to come alive. And so he begins to come to us as he came to Zerubbabel and said, Zerubbabel, I'm going to use you to change a whole nation if you will come alive, if you will awaken to my heart. All right. Verse 3. Also, I saw two olive trees by it or by the side of the lampstand. And one on, what, and one on the right side of the bowl and another on its left side. And I said to the angel who was speaking to me, what are these, my Lord? Like, what's the deal with this picture, God? And the angel who was speaking with me and answered and said to me, do you not know what these are? Don't you love that? It's like, God, what are you doing? 
Okay, so God's going to explain it to us. So often we sense a stirring in our heart going on. And it's so important we say, God, what are you doing? Why am I feeling like this? Why this agitation? Why this shift? Why this pressure? And God wants to speak to us and unveil it. And the Lord says to him in verse 6, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Are you ready? Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. What a great verse. You should, if you've actually got a physical Bible or whatever it is you carry, your phone, you should underline that verse in your Bible. It's a corker. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become like a plain. And he will bring forth the capstone or the top stone with shouts of grace upon grace. What an amazing verse, hey? Who are you, O great mountain? All the obstacles that we face. Who are you? You will bring that capstone or the finish, the completion with shouts of grace upon grace. We've been in the wilderness so long that we know that when the mountain comes, it was all of God. And we're all going to shout, that was God's grace in our life. It couldn't have been me. Also, the word of the Lord came in verse 8 saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation and his hands will finish it. Let me tell you, whatever God starts, he finishes it. He declares the end from the beginning. Isaiah 46, 10 says he reveals beforehand what hasn't occurred. So let me say the fact that you've started something is the clue that you're going to finish it. Why? Because God starts where it's finished. God finishes the work and comes back to the start. You're at the place now of starting and God starts where you finished and you finish where he starts. Did you hear that? God starts where you finish, you finish where he starts. And so the fact that you are starting is a sign that it's done because you couldn't start something that hasn't been done because God starts where it's finished. Are you getting that? There's a little clue there. He says, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid this foundation and they will finish it. I am born to manifest something that is finished. And the fact that God has put plans in your heart and purposes in your heart, they are assigned to you that it is a done deal. Faithful is he who has called you, who also shall do it. And the enemy has lied to so many people saying, God has quit. God has he's gone to plan B. You've started something, but you'll never see it to completion. He is a liar. He is a dirty, rotten liar. And I keep telling you, if the enemy says A, the truth is it's B. He is the greatest uh, advantage to your life. For whatever he says, reverse it and you find the truth. He is a compulsive liar. If he says you can't do it, you. If he says you'll always be sick, you will be. He is a pawn in the hands of of the Lord. Verse 10. Who has despised the day of small beginnings? For these seven rejoice to see the plumb line in the hands of Zerubbabel. They are the eyes of the Lord scanning to and fro throughout the whole earth. When I was a little boy, I'd go to sleep at night and I would have visions of eyeballs roaming across the earth, not knowing about this scripture. But God's eyes scanning throughout the earth, rejoicing to see the plumb line in the hands of Zerubbabel. In other words, Zerubbabel has started something and it's activated the seven spirits of God into action, which are the eyes of the Lord. And then I answered and I said to him in verse 11, what are these two olive trees at the right of the lampstand and on its left? And I further answered and said to him, what are these two olive branches that drip into the receptacles or the hands of the two golden pipes from which the golden oil drains? 
It's interesting that the olive branches drip oil into the hands of the golden pipes. So we have a promise today, fresh oil in our hands. Put your hands out with me today. These two olive trees are dripping oil into the hands. And so right now there is fresh oil on your hands. Your hands picture everything you're called to do. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. It's not by your might nor by your power, not your intellect, not your ingenuity. It's not anything of yourself. It is the anointing of the Holy Spirit that makes a difference. He is your ability, your favour, your breakthrough, everything that you need. It is fresh oil and there is an abundance of flow, a never ending flow. It's a ceaseless flow that, that he's seen in the spirit of oil into your hands, sticky hands full of oil. Amen? Amen. And he answered in verse 13 and said, don't you know what these are? And he said, no, I don't know, Lord. He said, these are the two anointed ones who stand before the Lord of the whole earth. These two trees are the two anointed ones from which oil comes and feeds the seven lamps. We'll get that to that in a minute. Nothing had been built like this before. It was an unusual picture. This picture that you saw before in Zechariah 4 was the last prophetic image connected to the temple that we see in the Old Testament. We had Moses' tabernacle, we had David's tent, Solomon's temple, and now we see this picture of the new creation believer. That picture of the trees and the lamp is a picture of how God is interacting with you right now. That is a picture, you go, really? Yes, that is a picture of how God wanted to interact with Zerubbabel, but it's also a picture of what God is doing in you right now, there are two trees that are feeding an endless supply of oil into the seven lamps that are burning inside of you. The two trees produce oil, they run in the bowls. The bowls feed the seven lamps, which are the seven spirits of God. The seven spirits of God, which is a picture of the Holy Spirit live inside each and every one of you. And the two trees are feeding the revelation and the manifestation of the seven spirits of God that are inside me. Did you know that you have seven spirits of God inside you? The seven spirits of God is a, as I said, a picture or a, a, um, a, a, a diagram of how Holy Spirit interacts inside of us. It is the manifestation of the Holy Spirit inside us that we need both to commune with Him, but also to get the building job done. Not by might, nor by power, but by the seven spirits of God inside me. And there is a flow from God Himself to me of unending oil, which is the seven, that feeds the seven spirits of God inside me. I have an unending supply inside of me. Now, what's interesting, if you've got your Bibles and you turn to Revelation 1.4, I'm going to give you a couple of scriptures in Revelation to, to show you this. Revelation 1.4 says, Grace to you and peace from Him who is and was and is to come. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today and forever. And from the seven spirits who are before His throne. Notice these seven spirits, we saw a picture of it, are before the throne of God. So in other words, when God looks out from His throne to the earth, He looks through the paradigm of the seven spirits. So it's like a big pair of glasses they are before the throne. So when God looks out to you and I, He's seen us, He's seen the answer, He's seen the paradigm of the seven spirits of God. So in other words, He's saying, if you want to function 
In my power, it's through the seven spirits of God. That is the answer. God is looking through those lenses. It filters the way He sees you. He sees the answer for your life as the seven spirits. If you wear a pair of blue glasses, the whole world is blue. God has a pair of glasses on called the seven spirits of God. That's the answer. Now, again, it says in Revelation chapter 4, verse 5, and from the throne proceeds lightnings, thundering and voices. Seven lamps of fire burn before the throne and they are the seven spirits of God. So we see again this time of the seven lamps that Zechariah is prophesying about and the seven spirits of God, and they are before the throne. And God is saying again to us, I see the answer to your life as the seven spirits of God. That's what I see. And you're coming to me and saying, God, I need empowerment, I need help. And God says, I want you to engage with Holy Spirit. For with Holy Spirit are the seven spirits of God and they are the answer to everything that you're gonna face as you begin to build in your life. Again, it says in Revelation 3.1, and to the angel of the church in Sardis, write these things, says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. So Jesus here appears to the church in the display of what the church needs. So it says, and to the angel of the church in Sardis. So he's coming to the church in the appearance as the seven lamps of God. Are you getting this? So he appears to the church in the manifestation of the remedy that we need. He says, these things say he who has the seven spirits of God. So Jesus comes to the church and he, when you look at him, it looks like he's carrying the seven spirits of God. He's saying to the church, this is what you need right now. What does the church in Australia need? We need an encounter with the Holy Spirit who comes as the seven spirits of God. And when we begin to understand who Holy Spirit is, what He carries, what He offers, we begin to step into another dimension that's not by might nor by power, but by the Spirit of God. The answer to this world, the greatest thing that you can offer this nation right now. Do you know what it is? To be filled with the seven spirits of God, to be filled with the Spirit. That is the greatest thing that you can do for your workplace is come to your workplace knowing that your hands drip with oil, that you've been with Holy Spirit. You've talked to Him and He's communicated to you and you're filled with the whole manifestation of the seven spirits of God. That's what God's saying. He's saying, I'm looking at you and I see the answer. Jesus is saying, I'm coming to you in the manifestation of what you need. Look at me now. We see Jesus as the seven lamps of God. And, and, and we go, why are you doing that, Lord? He's saying, because that's what you need. I am the manifestation of what you need right now. Hmm. I want you to notice about this lamp that when they built the lamp, it was hammered from one piece of gold. That's how they made it. Get out the hammer and beat the heck out of it. And mould it and shape it. Zerubbabel and all the Jews in Babylon and maybe you today have had the stuffing beaten out of you. Has anyone had a week where the stuffing's been beaten out of you? Only two. Are you any else alive out there? And Zacharias sees the picture of the lamp and, and the seven spirits of God and he, he begins to say, I need to be awakened to what God's doing. He looks at the lamp 
It's a lamp that's gone through great suffering, great hammering to carry the seven spirits of God upon it. And I don't know about you, but as I look at the church and I've observed what's happened, particularly in the last couple of years, it's like, Lord, the church has had, and I don't mean to be coarse using this word, but it's the only way I know how to describe it. It's had the stuffing knocked out of it. It's like the fire's gone up seven times hotter. And it's all relative because, you know, there are other countries where it's much worse. But this is our reality, okay? And, and we know that the pressure's been greater than ever before upon us. And I can only think that God has done a deep work in the hearts of His people because of what He has in store for us. In fact, the Holy Spirit drew out in, in Song of Solomon the bride into the wilderness for a period. And he drew the bride out into the wilderness so he could speak tenderly to her heart and prepare her heart to partner with the son, with the bridegroom. And I can only say to us that during this period of being beaten and slapped and kicked, as it were, it's because... God's not been doing that. But God has allowed His church to go through a season of testing and trials. And that's a whole other subject because He's been wanting us to get into a place where there's no more distraction, where there's no more performance, where it's just Him and me. And He can begin to speak into the issues of our heart that would prevent us running with Him in the fullness of His purpose for our life. And so the lampstand is beaten and shaped into the purpose of God. This has been part of our qualification, but the devil said to us, this very act has disqualified us. And what we think has disqualified us in this season is actually all about qualifying us for this season. Should I say that again? The devil has come to many Christians in this season and said, you have disqualified yourself. And God's saying, no, this season's been all about qualifying you in this hour. The church hasn't been disqualified. God's been preparing us. Daniel 12 verse 9 says that many will be purged and purified and refined. And and he goes on to say that through this purification, we are going to have insight to understand. And so this lampstand was beaten and hammered and purified because God was getting it ready to shine brightly. He's bringing revelation, truth and insight. The lampstand is going to burn brightly. It's going to come into a whole new realm of revelation. And I know from my life going through seasons of great pain, God is allowing circumstances to hammer me because He wants to bring me into a realm of great insight and revelation. Brokenness without the spirit of understanding brings despair. If you don't understand what this this season's been about, you will crack it and you'll get discouraged. Brokenness, the beatings, the hammerings without understanding is like, God, what are you doing? But brokenness with understanding and insight brings great hope for our life. You have been going through a season You were born in captivity and this has been a season of God preparing you for what He's about to do. He wants to release the sevenfold Spirit of God in a greater capacity. And all the decisions that you make in the wilderness will formulate the patterns of the throne life. Let me say it again. The decisions that you are making right now in wilderness times will formulate the patterns that you will live by in throne room living. You think, well, I was just getting, I don't want to read my Bible today. I don't think I'll pray today. I think I'll have a bad attitude today. 
But you decide, no, I'm going to have a good attitude. I'm going to praise. I'm going to remain joyful because that's where my strength comes from. I'm going to count it all joy when I go through sufferings because you're, you're perfecting something in me. And those decisions that you make, don't despise the day of small beginnings. Those decisions, see, it's the tiny things that are the big things. You're despising the decisions in the wilderness, not knowing that they will set the patterns when you're in breakthrough. Those decisions that you make now are so critical. They define who you become down the track. If you can keep a good attitude and praise God when everything's terrible, it's much easier to do when everything's well. And the pain of our present, pain of the past is preparation for a powerful future. There's a lot of P's in that, isn't there, Tamara? The pain of our past and present is just preparation for a powerful future. And so this is what... Zachariah has seen, he's seen this lamp and the, uh, uh, sorry, the lampstand and the seven lamps. And he's getting this picture. God has been preparing his people for greatness. And it's been a very difficult season. A whole generation has grown up in a wilderness-like atmosphere and God's about to shift it. Can I say to you that the winter season is surely coming to an end? You can stay there if you like, but I believe the winter season is coming to an end. Verse 12. And I asked the Lord, what are these olive trees, these two olive trees, two olive branches? He says, don't you know? And I said, no, Lord. And he said, these are the two anointed ones who stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. Many people believe that this is a picture of the Word and the Spirit coming together. These two trees that feed into our life perpetual oil of the Spirit. It's interesting, Jesus said in John 6.63, it's the Spirit that gives life, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak are Spirit and life. It's the Word and the Spirit coming together in this season about to release a whole new manifestation of the seven spirits of God. At Jesus' baptism, the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit came down and remained upon him. Jesus embodied the Word of God, embodied the seven spirits of God. The Word and the Spirit came together and then Jesus said, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Now think about that. As the Word and the Spirit come together upon us, there comes a manifestation of the sons and daughters of God. Right now what God is doing, He is releasing the Word and the Spirit upon His church in a whole new dimension that's going to release the seven spirits of God inside of us. Hmm. So Jesus came and he ministered out of this sevenfold spirit. John 3.34 says that God does not give the spirit by measure and that Jesus had the fullness of the seven spirits of God inside us. And he said, as the Father has sent me, I've sent you. What I carry without measure, I want you now to carry without measure. There is a flow from the Spirit of God and the Word of God inside us that will enable us to function in the Spirit of God without measure. Think about that. The Spirit of wisdom without measure. This is not the gift of the Spirit. This is actually functioning in a higher level where we begin to flow in a river in an endless supply of, of the spirit of wisdom upon our life. So when Jesus walked on the earth, he functioned in the spirit of wisdom that came upon him and he lived in it 24-7. He lived in the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel and the spirit of might, the spirit of the knowledge of God, the spirit of the fear of the Lord, the spirit of the Lord, all functioning without measure in your life. Isaiah 11 verse 1 talks about this. 
He says, And there will come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch will grow from its roots. It looked like Israel was finished. It was cut down to its roots and all of a sudden Jesus appears. Again, it looked like from the Babylonian captivity, it was all finished. It was cut down to its root. But then a branch appears. It may look like it's finished in your life, but one touch from the Holy Spirit, and all of a sudden something begins to appear inside us. It may look like your marriage is finished. It might look like your work is finished, whatever it might be. But it says here, there will come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse. A branch will grow out of its roots. Hear that? Jesus appears in the fullness of time. And he was the branch, but you are the branch as well. The Bible says that he is the vine and we are the branches. All of a sudden, Jesus begins to appear in us. The sevenfold spirit of the Lord begins to branch out from us. What an amazing thought. God took from the side of Adam, Eve, as a manifestation. She branched out from him. At the cross, blood and water flowed from the side of Jesus and the church branched out from him. And right now, as we encounter the Holy Spirit, the Lord wants to branch out and all of a sudden we become a living manifestation of who he is in this earth. Isaiah 11, 2 says, The Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. So God is birthing a spirit-filled people right now. Coming from Jesus is the sevenfold Spirit of God upon us right now. So let's listen to what they are as we finish. The Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. This is who the Holy Spirit is. Next week, we're going to unveil who the Holy Spirit is. So the first lamp is the Spirit of the Lord, which is Holy Spirit. He's going to begin to burn brightly in you. There is a endless supply of oil from the Spirit of God and the Word of God. Listen to me carefully. Holy Spirit is going to become so real and alive to us in this season. I feel His presence right now. There is this endless supply from the Holy Spirit pouring into us and from the Word of God pouring in. And as we begin to read the Word and fellowship with Him, there's going to come new revelation of who He is. He's not Casper the Friendly Ghost. He's not some it. He's not some nebulous force. He's a real person, as real as Jesus is, as real as the Father is. And He's come to live inside us and he's, he's, He will become to us more real than anyone else on this earth. More real than your partner, your wife, your husband, more real than your children. He's coming in this hour to make Himself known to us. And Isaiah prophesied about the seven spirits of God, which is the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And the first one is, I want to manifest myself to you. I am going to show what it means to walk in the Spirit, not by might nor by power. And the reason we exercise our own might might and power is because we don't know who Holy Spirit is. And if we don't know who He is, how can we operate with Him? How can we love Him and live with Him? And so this is a season where every single person here is going to nurture a fresh, a new relationship with the Holy Spirit. You at the end of this year will be able to say, I know Him like I've never known Him before. Something has come alive in me and I know Him as my greatest friend. I walk down the street and I feel His presence so He becomes more real than anyone else around me. Listen to me. It is You are able to know in the Spirit far deeper than you can know in the flesh. Jesus said, it's more beneficial that I go away. How could that be possible that Jesus could stand beside John who knew him intimately, who laid on his side and say to John, you know what, it's better 
If you want to know me, it's better that I go and I send the Holy Spirit and He will come and He will live in you. I will not leave you as an orphan. I will come, He will come and He will make known to you the Father. You won't feel like an orphan anymore. You will know the Father in the deeper means that I could ever tell you about the Father. Jesus knew the Father better than anyone. And Jesus is saying to John, if you want to know the Father, the Holy Spirit can do a better job than I can because He will come and live inside you. I can't do that. But He will bring my Spirit, who I am, and He'll come and live inside you. And in fact, if you want to know me, it's better that I go away and I will send you the Spirit. He will come and live inside you and you'll understand me in ways you could never understand me in the flesh. We know each other according to the Spirit. We no longer know Jesus according to the flesh. We know Him now according to the Spirit. That's why Paul, who never met Jesus, walked with Him, knew Jesus better than any other disciple in a deeper way because he knew Him according to the Spirit man. Holy Spirit came inside him and revealed Jesus to him. So I'm saying to you today, that as we begin to fellowship with the Holy Spirit, everything begins to shift and change. The first lamp was the Spirit of the Lord. In other words, He's saying, I'm going to show you who I am. Would you like that today? Would you like to be able to live with Him, wake up and know that He's there inside you, talking to you, helping you, giving purpose to your life? awakening you to what life is about. So many people, so many times we are walking through the day dead to what is reality, dead to our life, dead to our purpose. Holy Spirit saying, I'm here. I'm here. I want to help you. The Father and the Son are so jealous and possessive over the Holy Spirit He's the tender one. He says you can beat up on the Father and beat up on the Son, but if you beat up on the Spirit of God, watch out. He's the one that comes as the tender one that comes. He's the precious one that comes and reveals to us the purposes of God. Then he goes on to say in Isaiah 11, I will come as the Spirit of wisdom. Wow. I'll come as the Spirit of understanding. That's what we need right now. These flames of the Holy Spirit begin to burn in our life. He comes as the source of all wisdom. He comes as the source of understanding. And we're going to unpack that. He comes as the spirit of counsel. You know, he's the greatest life coach. And he wants to teach us. But he also comes as a spirit of might. He not just tells you what to do, but he empowers you to do it. He comes as the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Now, let me tell you something. Let us all take heed to this. We all want to encounter the Holy Spirit, I hope. We all want, as I said at the start, we want to look at the end of this year and say, I know Holy Spirit in a way I've never known Him before. But He comes as the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And what we could do in the past, as he comes and makes himself known, we'll become so much more sensitive to the things of God and what we could say and look at, watch, encounter, where we could go, it all begins to shift. And so that sounds incredibly restrictive. No, it's actually the opposite. It's incredibly freeing. Because all those things you've been watching, saying, doing have caused you to go to sleep. He wants you to come alive. He wants to make you free. So he comes as the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And that's not so we are scared of God, but we begin to understand the holiness and the greatness of God and we operate under that. In fact, Wigglesworth and Finney, that's what they lived in. Finney lived... And he had the spirit of the fear of the Lord upon him. So he would walk into a factory and hundreds of people would fall down under the power of God and begin to repent of their sin 
and be born again. He carried that upon his life. Then we talk about the great end time harvest of the Lord. We believe, I believe that a billion people will be born again in this next harvest. It'll be the greatest harvest the world has ever seen. But it'll come about because, I don't want to use this word, but ordinary, well, what's ordinary in the kingdom? The greatest, the least in the kingdom is greater than John the Baptist. But normal, supernatural, ordinary Christians, it's an oxymoron, they will carry the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Then they'll go into their workplace and people will begin to be smitten under conviction of God and transformed. And we have an invitation to go from a place where we've been through the wilderness and, and, and been hammered because God has been preparing us. He says, who are you, O great mountain? You shall become like a plain. We've, been got, we've gone through the mill. God's been preparing us for the great things he's about to do. So we'll be able to carry the seven spirits of God and it won't crush us, destroy us, won't go to our head, we won't get egotistical. We will know, we will shout, remember the capstone, we will shout grace upon grace. It was all God. I know it can't be me because I've spent seven years in the wilderness. If it was me, it would have happened earlier. It's God and he will get the glory. So, Lord, we pray today as we begin this series on the Holy Spirit and the sevenfold Spirit of God that you begin to reveal yourself. We've just scratched the surface, but we know that you are beckoning and inviting us now into a encounter with the sevenfold Spirit of God, with Holy Spirit and all the manifestations that you carry to cause us to overcome. And I'm asking right now, Holy Spirit, that you would come upon your people and baptise them with the sevenfold Spirit that you carry. Let the oil that comes from the two trees, from the Word that's been spoken, and you, Holy Spirit, as you come into this building, let that oil rest upon the hands of every believer right now. May we sense a greater anointing upon our life. May we sense a greater awareness of Your presence upon our life now. And as You prophesied through Zechariah to Zerubbabel, those days are finished, the new day has come. And it's now not by might nor by power, but by the Spirit of God. And every mountain that you face as you go into your future, it will become like a plane. It will be nothing. And what God has started in your life, He surely shall finish it. So Holy Spirit, we ask, as you poured out your Spirit upon Zerubbabel, would you pour out your Spirit now upon us, upon this church, upon this community, upon this city? We say, Lord, come Holy Spirit, come upon this city and transform it, we pray in Jesus' Name. Lift up your hands. Come Holy Spirit, pour out Your oil upon Your people today. Come as the Spirit of wisdom and the Spirit of understanding the Spirit of counsel and the Spirit of might, the Spirit of the fear of the Lord. Lord, we pray, come as the Spirit of knowledge, the knowledge of God. Come as the Sp Holy Spirit, as the Spirit. Come and reveal Yourself to us, I ask in Jesus' Name. So why don't you ask Him to do that now? Say, come Holy Spirit, come and fill me. Come and anoint me. Come and reveal Yourself to me. Come, Holy Spirit. Cause me to be so sensitive to You. Lord, it's my, my one request is that I would come to know You in such a deep way. I know You've said the greatest gift that we can give our city is to be filled with You. So would You come now, Holy Spirit, and make Yourself known to us this day. 
Come, precious Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Thank you.